Turning once again in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, and reading this morning verses 20 through 25. And he confessed and denied not but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. We'll stop right there. Hold on one second. Um, my note. There's a story of an open air preacher one time that had his, just before he began to preach, his notes blew out into the audience and he said, I guess I'll have to depend on the Holy Spirit this morning. (laughs) Interesting story. Last week we dealt with verse 20 where uh, John the Baptist says, and he confessed and denied not but confess, I am not the Christ. A very interesting statement. And we said last week, uh, basically we had two points. We said that uh, we spoke of the importance of the antithesis. And specifically, as it is expressed thusly, you have not said, what the gospel is, unless at one and the same time you have said what it isn't. We, uh, this is a common to our everyday life. We, uh, it, the more important something is, the more correspondingly important it is for it to be distinguished from that which it isn't. Especially when Uh, something is, especially when it is, when it can be easily confused with something else. So let's say that again. The more important something is, the more correspondingly important it is that we distinguish it from that which it is not. And so we said, you have not said what the gospel is unless and until you have said what it isn't. The scripture frequently, in fact, I was looking this up, No less, interesting, listen to this, no less than four times are we not only uh, informed about deception, but no less than four times we are commanded, be not deceived. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, we are not, as God's people, we are not ignorant of his, meaning Satan's, we're not ignorant of his devices. The enemy uses devices. He uses sleight of hand. And just to give you an instance, of, to give you a, a, a feel for how frequently this idea is brought up in Scripture, the idea, what are we speaking of? Deception. How we can be deceived. And in being deceived, at least temporarily, if we're God's people, uh, be deceived as to what the gospel is because we've gone temporarily as, as uh, Galatians 5, 4 says, you are fallen from grace. How we can be fallen from grace in our minds and, and revert to thinking in terms of works, religion. Listen to these passages of scripture, noting the importance that we be not deceived. Matthew 24. And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. 
and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. What does that tell us? That tells us that if you, as we speak, if you and if I are not uh, deceived, as I speak, there's only one reason for it. Because we can't be deceived. We're kept from this, this power of deception is just that strong. To see the very elect. And Jesus answered, answering them began to say, Take heed lest, take heed lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You notice this same word over and over again? Many! Many shall be deceived. The thing that I've noticed, one thing that I've noticed is that firstly, when I was in the false gospel, there was no there there was no concept of deception because if you weren't a Christian, it was simply because you haven't made your decision. You had not made your decision, so you weren't a Christian. Deception didn't enter into the picture. But in in the uh, Reformed churches, we are when we should expect to be when we ex, we should expect these things to be explained clearly. They're not explained explained clearly. Nor are we warned about the danger of deception. And even to take the cake, here's the one that is the most scary: Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. And so we have the very um, possibility of being self-deceived. Such is the power of deception. Little Timmy took a drink, but he will drink no more. For what he thought was H2O was H2SO4. So we see the importance of distinguishing between water and sulfuric acid, between the gospel and that which masks itself as the gospel. And secondly, we said last week, owing to the importance of the antithesis, not only is it important to distinguish, not only have we not said what the gospel is, unless at one and the same time we said what it isn't. Secondly, we haven't said what the gospel is, if shortly after we say what the gospel is, we contradict ourselves. The apostle, excuse me, John the Baptist said, He confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not. He will, in other words, he confessed and denied not, but confessed and denied not. That's the importance. That we not only say what the truth is, but we don't and we take heed not to contradict ourselves after we've said what it is, which is so prevalent in the church today. What is the gospel? The gospel we have said over and over again. The gospel is spelled T-U-L-I-P. T is the problem. What did we say salvation is? This is an excellent definition, I think, of salvation. It's deliverance from the greatest evil and being made partaker of the highest good. And what is the greatest evil? The greatest evil is total, complete, and utter depravity. I heard a reformed leader say this. Now we're speaking of the proclaiming what the truth is and then shortly thereafter contradicting oneself. He said in speaking of total depravity, he said, we frequently, when we use the word total, we frequently mean something like complete or uh, as much as. Uh, or in every area. When we say total, we, we, we frequently mean complete or in every area. Uh, but when we speak of total depravity, we mean that man is only affected in every area by sin. Now, notice what he did. In, in, in magic, and we live close to the magic kingdom, but in magic, what do they say? 
The hand is quicker than the eye. And what this is what happens with magic. The, the magician wants you to concentrate on something while he's doing something else. And that's what's, being, that's what's happening here. He wants you to think he's dealing with the adjective when, when he's really changing the definition of the noun. Notice what he said. We frequently, when we say total, we frequently mean uh, 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 complete or in every way. But total depravity only means that we're affected in every way. What did he do? He kept the in every way and changed the meaning of depravity from total wickedness to total affectedness. Yes, we believe in total depravity, but we don't believe in depravity. Secondly, deliverance from the greatest evil and being made partaker of the highest good. And how are we made partaker of the highest good? First of all, by unconditional election. Why did we say uh, unconditional? Why did we say election is entitled unconditional election? Because owing to the fact that we're totally, completely wicked, salvation must be not from within ourselves, but from without ourselves. And so it must be the decision from the foundation of the world that God the Father, remember Romans, let's look at Romans 8, uh, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Notice carefully, for whom he did foreknow. That word foreknow means to forelove, to have an intimate relation with relationship with beforehand. And so, how are we saved? We're saying Oh, we are saved owing to the fact that God has elected us. He's placed his love on us from the foundation of the world. We spoke last week of that illustration of the, the potato illustration. What were we speaking of? We were speaking of the concept of common grace. Let's just, for the sake of argument, let's say that uh, common grace, there, that there is such a thing as common grace. Well, the relationship between, the similarity between common grace and what we call special grace is that both of them deal with the love of God. What's the first verse they go to? The common graces to demonstrate, to so-called prove common grace. Matthew 5, 44 and 45. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. So the similarity between common grace and special grace is both of them, or, or common grace and election, is that both deal with the love of God. What's the difference? Pay close attention. The difference is this. And we're not caricaturizing our opponent's position. We're not, this is not a caricature. This is what they really say. The, the difference between common grace and special grace is that common grace is not soteriological, meaning it does not save. And what is salvation? Salvation is reconciliation from... It is, from the salvation from the deliverance from the greatest evil and being made partaker of the highest good. Salvation is delivering deliverance from rebellion and reconciliation to the law of God. Specifically, in this instance, remember the illustration of the pet potatoes. This person, now this person is perhaps most probably the greatest uh, influence with respect to common grace in the 20th century. This is his illustration. He said that I would rather do business with a non-Christian uh, who has a lot of common grace than with a Christian who has special grace, a lot of special grace, but very little, if any, common grace. And so what was he saying? He was saying, I would rather do business with a person who has common grace with who has non-soteriological grace, which does not reconcile him to the law of God, specifically the ninth commandment, honesty. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. I would rather do business with this person who hasn't been reconciled to honesty and who is by nature dishonest than with a Christian with a lot of special grace who has been reconciled, who is in principle an honest person. So I'd rather do business with a person who is in principle dishonest than a person who is in principle honest. That's a, 
hideous nature of common grace. Yes, I believe in unconditional election. I believe in the love of God, but I believe in non-soteriological grace which reconciles people to the ninth commandment. Total uh, contradiction. Thirdly, a limited atonement. Limited atonement, we've heard. Uh, frequently, if you haven't heard it, you will hear it again and again. Uh, and now we're talking, when we're talking about limited atonement, in the evangelical, the quote evangelical world, the vast majority of people oppose limited atonement. So what we're speaking of is a small group of people who assent to limited atonement. What do they say? And you've heard them. If you haven't, you will. They say something like this. We believe in limited atonement. We believe that Christ's death was sufficient for all but efficient only for those who believe. Now, um, this statement came from somewhere. See, it's, uh, uh, on the surface, if you haven't researched this, it doesn't, it doesn't sound uh, too much out of the way. But even from a superficial standpoint, you should, th- you should be thinking this. Christ's death was sufficient for all. And here's the question that should pop into your head. Who has ever said that it wasn't? So you're addressing a problem that has never existed. Who has ever said that if, that if uh, God the Father elected a hundred more people, Christ would have had to shed more blood for their salvation? Nobody's ever said that I can tell uh, that Christ's death was not sufficient for all. So where does this come from? Sufficient for all, efficient only for those who believe. There was a man in the 17th century by the name of John Preston who, in teaching on the doctrine of, what are we talking about now? Limited atonement. On teaching on the doctrine of limited atonement, he turned to uh, to Mark, the last chapter of Mark, Mark 16, 15. He read this verse, and this was his exposition. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Christ said to his disciples, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Meaning, in the words of John Preston, meaning, go and tell every man. John 16, 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go and tell every man without exception that there is good news for him. The gospel, preach the gospel. Go and tell every man without exception that there is good news for him. Christ is dead for him. So here's the catch. Why do people say that, that, that Christ's death is sufficient for all, but only efficient only for those who believe? It's because of what John Preston said here. And what he said was this. Christ died only for those that the Father gave him. But he is dead for every man. Meaning what? And here's his explanation. Sufficient, you got it? Sufficient for all, efficient only for those who believe. Some people believe and other people don't believe. Why is it that some people believe and other people don't believe? And here's John Preston's explanation. God, from the foundation of the world, made an absolute covenant of grace with the elect. Meaning what? They are going to be saved. The Son is going to procure the salvation of all the Father chose. So he made an absolute covenant of grace with the elect, but he made a conditional covenant of grace with the reprobate. Meaning what? Go and tell every man without exception that there is good news for him. Conditional covenant of grace with that. Christ is dead for him. In the words of a modern follower... Of John Preston. Now, John Preston didn't come up with this idea. This idea was, was uh, as far as we can tell, uh, come up with in the 16th, in the 17th century. Preston was the excuse me. Uh, Preston was later on in the 17th century, but earlier um, by a guy by the name of Amarot, and Amarot taught this concept: this absolute covenant of grace with the elect and a conditional covenant of grace with the reprobate. Now, how can there be a conditional covenant of grace with a reprobate? And here's why. Because their concept of the atonement was that Christ died uh, and in his death, 
he will save not only in an absolute sense all of the elect, he will save the reprobate if they will only believe because his death is sufficient for them. You see how it works out? So they try to make a distinction, which is a false distinction. Yes, but once again, between Christ died only for the elect, but his death is sufficient for all men. He has removed, they'll say it this way on occasion, he has removed the obstacle, all obstacles to the salvation of every man because his death is sufficient for every man. With regard to irresistible grace, so he said, deliverance from the greatest evil, total depravity, God the Father determined to place his love on certain men from all eternity. He sends the Son to procure the salvation of all and only those that the Father chose. And the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit irresistible grace to irresistibly overcome our rebellion against God. And that's why this is called irresistible grace. And what is the relationship between the work of the Spirit and the work of the Son? God demands that we have a perfect righteousness owing to our total depravity, of which we have none. He demands that we have a perfect righteousness of which we have none. He sends the Son to procure that righteousness. But when we're born into the world, we have none of it. We have none of the righteousness that He demands we have and of which we have nothing. And so, the Son comes and works out a perfect righteousness on our behalf. He, uh, he works out he obeys the command, the, the, the law of God perfectly because we have never obeyed it in any sense. And he pays the penalty for our positive transgressions. But when we're born, we do not have that righteousness. And so the Holy Spirit comes and irresistibly works faith in us through the preaching of the gospel. Which faith unites us to the righteousness of Christ? And we're saved. And so... Irresistible grace. And how is this denied among Reformed congregations today? It is denied thusly in what they call the free offer of the gospel. The free offer of the gospel says that the gospel is to be, it is not the idea that the gospel is to be indiscriminately proclaimed to all men. The free free offer of the gospel means this, that though God is determined to save only some men from the foundation of the world, whenever the gospel is preached, he desires the salvation of every man to whom it comes. And this is related to their concept of Christ being dead for all men. And so, yes, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, effectually overcomes the unbelief of some people because there's an absolute covenant of grace with the elect. However, Since Christ is dead for all men, you are able to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because every obstacle to your salvation has been overcome. So we have yes, but once again. Um, But John the Baptist said, says, he confessed and denied not, but confessed I am not. And uh, briefly, we want to deal with that word confess. The word confess is a compound word. It is homo lageo. Homo means the same. Lageo means to speak. So isn't this interesting? He confessed. Not only does it say he confessed and denied not, but confess, I am not. But the very word confess means to say the same thing as. So in confessing, he was saying the same thing. <laughs> He was saying that 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In confessing our sin, we're saying the same thing that God says about our sin. There's no excuse for it. But in this particular instance, in confessing and denying not and confessing, he's saying the same thing as himself. Got that? So he doesn't say one thing and five minutes later, contradict himself so today our outline the first point was the importance of the antithesis we haven't said what the gospel is unless and until we have said and one at the same time what it is and secondly 
We don't say what the gospel is and then turn around and deny the gospel, as we see they have done. Many people who call themselves reformed with respect to unconditional election, yes, but limited atonement, yes, but Christ has died only for those that the Father gave in, but he's dead for all men. Thirdly, uh, irresistible grace, the Holy Spirit uh, overcomes the unbelief of only those that the Father gave the Son, and yet he desires that that enmity be overcome with respect to every man every time the gospel is proclaimed. So, John the Baptist, let's look at once more that passage. He confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. Then said they unto him, who art thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou? That sort of that sort of reminded me of the Democrats there. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, who art thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What say? The Democrats are hard nosed, huh? You go out there and you give us an answer. Whereas, the, 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 get Robert Bork is up and he, uh, is up for Supreme Court justice, and they let him be denied. The Republicrats, uh, the, 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 the people without resolve. That we may, hey, one thing we know, we got to give an answer back to those guys that sent us. We may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. What is our point here? Our point is this. Not only did John the Baptist knew know who he was not, but he knew and confessed who he was. And when he confessed who he was, he was, and we are. He was what he was, and we are what we are insofar as our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ determines who he was and who we are. Because what he was saying in essence was this. The voice crying in the wilderness. And what was he crying? Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And John the Baptist represents every single Christian. We are not whatever we are not, but we are. What we are. What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15, 10? By the grace of God, I am what I am the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. I am what I am. John the Baptist was what he was insofar as his relationship to Christ determined what he was. Hebrews 12. We're confident that the book of Hebrews was, was written by the Apostle Paul, but even if it were not, Hebrews 12 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We are what we are in so far as we are related to Christ who has given us the faith. Through which faith? Christ's perfect righteousness is imputed to us. Or in the words of Peter, 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once uh, suffered for sins, the, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins. The just for the unjust. I am what I am because Christ, the righteous, suffered for the unrighteous, which the Holy Spirit convinced me which I was. Unrighteous, the just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God, effectually. Bring us to God. Um, and so, we are what we are in so far as, it, as John the Baptist was, as our relationship to Christ determines what we are. And so, lastly, we're going to speak of the importance of Christ to us. The importance of Christ, objectively speaking, in this world. That which no man can deny. We just entered 2016. What is 2016. It is a date. It is a number which represents that a man. What do we say? 
um, Philip Schaff said that the second most important event, I, I can't get this out of my mind, the second most important event in Christian history, in history, not Christian history, the second most important event in history is the Christian Reformation. And the first important, the most important event in history is the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, which this date represents. And I don't care if you call it common era, it's CE and BCE. That number represents the dividing point of history, objectively speaking. Secondly, we were taught in school, I don't know from, from how long ago, but a few hundred years ago, Everyone was a geocentrist, meaning that the earth is the center of the solar system and all the planets, including the sun, revolve around the earth. And the reason they said that was the, the, the scripture talks about the sunrise, sunset. It talks about the sun on one occasion. The sun stood still. Well, they, what do they say about that? Well, well, the sun stood still. That's phenomenological language. <laughs> yeah, well, that's sophistry, in my opinion. Sophistry. What's sophistry? Pretending to be smart when you're ignorant, said uh, concisely. Uh, that's phenomenological language at the sun. So, ah, we all know that the earth moves, the sun doesn't move. So it was phenomenal. No, I believe. And, and, and a few hundred years ago, when we transferred, when scientists transferred from geocentricity to heliocentricity, there was no basis, scientifically speaking, for transferring. It's sort of like I like to think of you're sitting in your car. This has happened to all of us. Sitting in your car, in your parked car, and somebody beside you backs up, and you think you're going forward, don't you? Unless and until your foot is on the brake, and then you're convinced you're not going forward. And so that's the way I view is that it's, it, it's all, it all depends on your perspective. Is the earth moving or is the earth stationary and the other planets are moving? What's the importance of this? We hold the geocentricity because we believe that the most important event in, in the history of the universe happened on this planet. The incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the importance of it. Secondly, Theologically speaking, the importance of Christ. Why do we emphasize total depravity? We emphasize total depravity because of Christ. Because it teaches that we have none of the righteousness that God demands of us. John, uh, uh, Matthew 5, 48. Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And we believe that our only hope owing to our sinfulness, is in the perfect active and passive, as they say, or the perfect righteousness of Christ, which he worked out on behalf of his people, the apex of which was his dying on the cross. With respect to unconditional election, and unconditional means two things. It means, first of all, God's election must be unconditional because owing to the fact that you are a total depra totally depraved sinner, it can't be sinner. It can't be conditioned on anything in you. Secondly, Christ's unconditional election is conditioned on something, and it's conditioned on the perfect righteousness on the Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Theologically speaking, because of total depravity, it has to be Christ. Secondly, unconditional election is conditioned on Christ. Thirdly, limited atonement. The Father has determined to place His love on some from the foundation of the world. And the Son comes and procures this salvation which the Father has foreordained for His people. And as we speak, this is, this is how important this is. So we're, we're preaching. We're preaching. We're not preaching in, in, in a vacuum. As we speak, 2016, a new book has come out. New book. Remember the guys, uh, the, the Baptists are becoming, I don't know if you know this, but the Baptists are becoming more and more and more charismatic. Every day. 
And what is the charismatic movement? One aspect of it is called the full gospel. Yeah, the full gospel is often used as a synonym for Pentecostalism and charismatic Christianity. Protestant movements originating in the 19th century, early Pentecostals and Charismatics saw their teachings on baptism with the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts and divine healing as a, as a return to the doctrines and power of the apostolic age because of this many early Pentecostals and Charismatics call their movement the apostolic faith or the full gospel. We only have half the gospel. You only have half the gospel unless you believe in the miracles. Unless you believe in speaking in tongues. And so, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? This new book was not written by a charismatic. This new book was written by a Presbyterian. You know what the title of the book is? It's called The The Whole What do we say? The Charismatic Movement? The Full Gospel. This new book is called The Whole Christ. The whole Christ. You haven't believed, according to this Presbyterian leader, huge leader in Presbyterian church, reform movement. You haven't believed in the full Christ if you only believe that Christ came and procured the salvation of all that the Father gave him. You must also believe that Christ is dead for every man. You must believe that there is an absolute covenant of grace with the elect and also there is a conditional covenant of grace. With the reprobate because Christ is dead for every man. And one of these leaders has said, I want to be able to say to every person on the street, Christ died for you because if you believe in him, then the blood covers you. See, that's exactly the same thing. Sufficient for all, efficient only for those who believe. Your faith makes Christ's death efficacious rather than the opposite of it. What's the, what's the opposite of it? Christ's death. We're going to get to that right now when we get to irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. The relationship between Christ and irresistible grace. What do we say irresistible grace is in space and time? Though the Father has set his love on all his people from eternity, though the Son comes and procures the salvation of all, does everything necessary to our final salvation when we're born in this world, we have no relationship to the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But through the gospel... Our unbelief is overcome and we believe subjectively we're totally wicked. And objectively our only hope is in the righteousness of Christ. And through that faith, Christ's perfect righteousness is imputed to us. And not only does this, why is, why is Christ important? not only to total depravity, not only to unconditional election, because election is conditioned on Him and His righteousness, not only because of limited discernment, because it is Christ and Christ alone who has procured our salvation, Christ is necessary to irresistible grace, not only because, through faith, His perfect righteousness is imputed to us, but for another very important reason, and that is the doctrine of impetration. It teaches us and this is, a, we're going to go over this in a few minutes, a few hours. <laughs> we passed like a few minutes. After lunch, we plan, Lord willing, to go over this. Chapter 8 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Listen to this statement. Christ, as far as irresistible grace is concerned, the work of the Holy Spirit as relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. To all those for whom Christ hath purchased redemption, he, do, he, not talking about the Holy Spirit, to all those for whom Christ hath purchased redemption, he does certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same, making intercession for them and revealing unto them in and by the word the mysteries of salvation, effectually persuading them by his, by his spirit to believe and obey and governing their hearts by his word and spirit, overcoming all their enemies by his almighty power and wisdom in such manner and ways as are most consonant to his wonderful and unsearchable dispensation. Can you talk like that? Let me answer, no. 
in such manner and ways as are most consonant to his wonderful and unsearchable dispensation. What does dispensation mean here? doesn't mean dispensationalism. It means in, in, in such manner and ways as are most consonant to his wonderful and unsearchable role that he plays owing to the fact that God has given him that role, that dispensation. He has procured all the benefits which the Father has determined to give us and he sends his spirit so that this will take place in space and time. We are what we are only insofar as we are related to what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. Perseverance of the saints. What's the relationship since owing to our total depravity salvation is and must be not from within us but from without us. It is of the Father's election, by the Son's redemption, through the Spirit's regeneration, and therefore it is and must be an everlasting salvation. But this everlasting salvation is once again dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 5, let's look at that. First Peter one five. Let's begin with verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again, God the Father, has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We were kept by the power of God through faith, faith in the perfect righteousness of Christ and through the faith which Christ procures for us and sends His Spirit to give us. And then 1 Peter 1. Yeah, three, let's continue. Verse 6, let's read verse 5 again. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be frowned unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. At the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen ye love, and whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. And so we see the all importance of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are, as the Apostle Paul said, we are what we are. And as John the Baptist said, I am the voice, I am not the Christ. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. We are what we are insofar as we are related to the Lord Jesus Christ. And lastly, listen to this. What do we say? You're not... uh, uh, You're not uh, under the law. But under grace. What do we say that means? We said when we're under the law, a person who is under the law, his relationship to God is determined by his performance in keeping the law, which is zero. And we're under grace because our relationship to God is determined by what? By Christ keeping the law. But the last point we want to make is this. Not only are the elect, not only are we what we are owing to our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone else is what he is owing to his relationship to Christ, which is no relationship to Christ. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As 
Jonathan Edwards says, if Christ will not be glorified in you, if you do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he will glorify himself on you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this, on the Lord's day. We thank thee for the opportunity of looking once again at the all importance of our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is everything. As one person said, the Apostle Paul was a Christ intoxicated man. And we are also because we know that everything we have and everything we are determined, is determined by our relationship to Christ. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing page 150, Psalm 73, 1 through 11.